Hello, friends. Thank you for joining me again today. It's summertime here. The sky is blue with some lightly tinted white clouds looking like they were they were made with a light brush using the lightest of strokes in the form of a feather. There are some straight lines that show where planes have passed by. And there we are. We're standing on the ground and we need to lift our heads up high to look up into the sky and there we see the beauty of the world. The beauty of the world that surrounds us. I don't know, but sometimes it doesn't it come to you that just for a second you, you stop to think and you ask yourself, where is God? <laughs> but first, let's, let's begin in prayer. The Bible tells us in Colossians, For it was through him that everything was made, whether spiritual or material, seen or unseen. Jesus, Lord of the earth, by you all things were created, all creeping things, all flying things, all living things, all dying things. The blossom on a cherry tree, the smell of the earth after the rain. Each cell within a human brain, each fallen leaf, each towering pine reveals your intricate design. Jesus, Lord of the earth, or better, Lord of the universe, in you all things now hold together. In you th all things are made new. And so, Lord, we ask, give us strength, faith, peace, and a clear understanding, allowing us to work for you in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's text has us beginning to read at verse 15 of Colossians chapter 1 where the writer started a poem. It begins something like this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. <laughs> Friends, these words remind me of something I experienced a few days ago when my wife and I sat just outside of a goal or prison museum we were visiting. The prison had operated for 130 years in the town where we now live. On one hand, we felt down to earth, while inside we looked at the four meter high prison walls. On the other hand, just outside of the prison, sitting on a bench near a ravine, we could appreciate the valley we could see, the forest, the lake, the sky, and we got to thinking that the creator of the universe created it all. From the greatest we could see to the tiniest we can't even imagine. We took the opportunity, looked up, and took in the immensity of the sky. And friends, then when you turn and look down and you see what is in front of you, when you see a beautiful view, well, we saw the cliff with a green carpet full of trees and the river beneath, the lake in the distance, a bridge crossing the river. Friends, for us, this became a time to stop, a moment to stop, to pause, to breathe, and to pray, to remember to be thankful to our Lord for all he has made. Okay, today's message begins where we left off last time, when we looked at Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. So today we will be going forward, beginning at verse 15. As I mentioned at this point, the writer began a poem, and then he explained that poem. And then he gets into a second point where he expounds that he works for the church. But overall in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul tells us basically three things about Jesus. First, he says, He 
delivered us from darkness into light. And we kind of looked at that last week in verses 1 to 14. Second, Paul tells us that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God in verse 15. And third, Paul tells us that only Jesus Christ is the head of the church in verse 24. Okay, with these little bits of info as a backdrop, and if you have your Bible on hand and you're able, please open your Bibles to the Epistle to the Colossians chapter 1. Today I will be reading verses, 20, sorry, verses 15 to 28. Again, Colossians 1, verses 15 to 28. Here's what it says. Christ is the invisible is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme, over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single thought, without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles, too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you the assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. 
Word of the Lord. Okay, friends, remember those three things that I mentioned just before our reading? Those are really points to observe, to remember, and to put into practice within our own Christian lives. First, he delivered us from darkness into light. Second, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. And third, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Okay, so about that first point where Paul says, he has delivered us from darkness into light. Let me offer Dave Johnson, an Olympic decathlete, as an example. He has been considered a hero during the 92 Olympics. But it wasn't always that way. Growing up, Dave was known for his drinking and his wild, destructive behavior. Then, just before he entered college, Dave Johnson became a born-again Christian. It changed everything in his life. Johnson's Olympic coach claims that Dave dedicated, dedicates his talents to God and that this is his motivation behind his decathlon success. Friends, around this planet that we live on, there are millions of people who know what it is to be delivered from the dominion of darkness into a new light, into the kingdom of God. So you might ask, well, how does this happen? Well, there's only one way. Through faith in Christ. And that, friends, that's the first thing Paul tells us about Christ. He delivers us from darkness to light. The first five verses of today's scripture are a poem or a, a Christ hymn, which flow out of the final introductory verses to, of Paul's letter to the Colossians. And really, the final two verses of last week's scripture from Colossians are worth remembering. They're worth remembering, and I'll repeat the, the first two verses of today's text along with them for context. Verse 13. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Verse 15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. Yes? yes. The second point. Paul tells us that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Friends, those who see Jesus as only a man, only a teacher, only a good person, miss all the richness of the Christian faith. To them, actually, to anyone, Christianity even becomes senseless if Jesus is identified as only. And so what does it mean when Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God? It means, first of all, that God has acquainted himself with our condition. The God of all creation humbled himself and was in the likeness of a man. He knows what it is to be hungry, thirsty, or tired, to experience what we experience. Folks, on one hand, one of the most tragic losses 
caused by the secularization of our society today has been the loss of a sense of personal significance. And where does that leave integrity? Where does that leave your goals? A result of that is so very many people feel that their lives really don't count. And friends, admit it, that is a sad state of affairs. On another hand, our lives have a high value in God's eyes. He loves us. So much so that he laid aside his royal robes and became one of us. He walked where we walk. Folks, our lives are carefully planned by God, so it follows. We are important to him. <laughs> Verse 15 takes me back to Semini, where one of the first things we talked about in class was the importance of faith. We even memorized, <laughs> but admittedly, admittedly don't always remember to apply what Hebrews 11, 1 to 3 says. And it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Colossians 1 is striking in that while the cross is mentioned, the suffering and death of Jesus are not the primary focus of the hymn. This is in, in sharp contrast to Hebrews 11 or Philippians 2, uh, verses 8 to 11, in the New King James Version, where it says, He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to, glory, to the glory of God the Father. Here in Colossians verse 15 it says Christ is the visible image of the invisible God he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation friends this verse emphasizes the power and divinity of the Messiah Jesus Christ is described as the source of all created things as the source which quickens and sustains all things as the head of all things. Listen to Psalm 103 verses 19 and 20. The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there he rules over everything. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Friends, let's remember that one of the attributes of God is the sovereignty or the supremacy of God. The supremacy of God is an attribute we don't often talk about, but it is closely related to God's sovereignty. In fact, we might say that God is sovereign because he is supreme. God being the creator and supreme ruler over all things is therefore sovereign over them. Yes? The theologian Dr. Stephen Lawson explains, and I quote, To say that God is sovereign is not to say merely that he is stronger than everyone else, although this is true. Rather, to call him sovereign is to ascribe to him a rule and authority that transcends space and time, leaving nothing outside its scope. End quote. What does it mean to affirm the supremacy of Christ? 
In the simplest of terms, to affirm the supremacy of Christ is to affirm that Jesus is God. Yes? Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines supreme as highest in rank or authority, or highest in degree or quality. In essence, there is none better. The supreme of something is its ultimate. Jesus is the ultimate in power, glory, authority, and in importance. And why is the supremacy of Christ important? Christ is supreme. Folks, this doctrine is essential to our view of and worship of Christ. The supremacy of Christ affirms that Jesus is fully God. He is not simply a man greater than the rest, but is truly above all creation as only God can be. And that leads me to the third point where verse 24 says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. Paul here is affirming that only Jesus Christ is the head of the church. That's important. Not you or me or a chairperson or a pastor or any other man-made authority. But Christ, only Christ, is the head of the church. Yes? In verse 24, Paul may mean that suffering is unavoidable in bringing the good news of Christ to the world. When we suffer, Christ feels it with us. But this suffering can be endured joyfully when it changes lives and brings people into God's kingdom. Okay, so let's look at church. Church is a place we should trust. A place where we should pray together. A place where we should listen and learn about his words. But friends, it's also a, a funny place sometimes. Listen to this. A lady wrote to Reader's Digest recently and to tell about a friend of hers, a professional organist, who asked to play for a wedding, who was asked to play for a wedding. And, well, unfamiliar with the church's organ, her friend went to the sanctuary to practice. And then she became curious about a, a small keyboard that kind of slid out from under the other two regular keyboards. And she tapped out a couple of bars of a children's song. But she heard nothing. Then she played a few more notes. But still no organ music. Just then a man came running into the church shouting, Who's playing three blind mice on the church steeple bells? <laughs> she had been playing this children's tune on the carillon for the community to hear. How do you think she might have felt? The core of this story is this. The church sometimes is a place to lift us up when we make mistakes. It's a place to help us understand our confusion or our stubbornness. A place to come closer to God by recognizing the invitation Jesus Christ had come to make to each one of us. He wants us to come and to follow him. Paul said he was proclaiming the entire message of God, not just for a group of people, but for the whole of the church. God also called God's plans a message, the message that had been kept secret for centuries, for generations past. Not in the sense that only a few would understand, but because it was hidden until Christ came. Through Christ, 
God's plan was made available to all. Listen again to what the second half of verse 27 tells us. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. Yes, friends, that is the message. Christ lives in you. God planned to have his son, Jesus Christ, live in the hearts of all who believe in him, even Gentiles like the Colossians and us. So here comes the question for you. Do you know Christ? And this is important, friends. Remember, he is not hidden. If you will come to him and allow him in. Friends, here in Colossians, we are looking for the truth. And in verse 28, Paul tells us the truth of what we are to do. Verse 28. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. Folks, the word perfect means mature or complete, but it doesn't mean flawless. Paul wanted to see each believer mature spiritually. Friends, we must work wholeheartedly, just like an athlete. At the same time, we need to remember that we should never strive to use our own strength alone. We have the power of God's Spirit working in us. Remember that. We have the ability to learn and to grow daily. We are motivated by love, not by fear or pride, yes? Knowing that God gives us the perfect energy that nothing and no one can compare, even the most difficult of times of suffering you might have to face. Friends, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit is always dwelling in us. Yes? Amen. Pray with me. Father God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, three in one, Father, in your sovereignty, you created everything we see, down to even the smallest insect. You carefully planned each one of us. You created the sun to give light and the moon to reflect it at night. You created every star in the universe. You allow them to give direction so we don't lose our path. You've given people a heart to serve and the church to gather to worship. Lord, the world is changing, and sometimes we don't know what to do. And so, Lord, help us to always find you and understand what the task is that you have for each one of us. Thank you, Lord, for wisdom we find in your word. Paul says, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. Oh, Lord, we need you. We need your blessing and strength. Keep us humble and give us the courage to not give up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, allow me to speak a benediction. Gracious God, we pray for all your children. May we clearly know your will and achieve the height and depth of spiritual wisdom and understanding that you desire for us. Lord, send us into the world. Strengthen us with your infinite power and according to your glorious might so that we will have everything we need to hold on and endure hardship patiently and joyfully with the peace that only comes from you. And so go in peace to love and serve our Lord, doing it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Friends, be blessed until we meet again.